Good morning, guys. My name is Rick Vance. I'm the director for the Center for Men's Ministries at the General Commission on United Methodist Men. Uh, before I begin with uh, my conversation about domestic violence today, I first would uh, like to thank you for the support of Scouting and Men's Ministries with the General Commission. It's because of your support that we're able to develop the resources and the trainings that, that we do and are able to provide you with one-on-one -on -one support uh, in many situations. So thank you for that. It is a great privilege to be with you today for this Igniting, Minis, uh, this Igniting Faith um, conference. Um, I um, have been with you all uh, for many of your conferences and it is always a privilege. Uh, the coronavirus has, has caused us to do things in a new way and have caused some problems. And, uh, the coronavirus, first of all, has kept me from getting over to Georgia, which, I, which I'm uh, sorry for because I enjoy being with you and the fellowship that we share. But also, um, the coronavirus has caused a, a significant problem that I want to talk with you about today, and that is the issue of domestic and gender-based violence. Um, we have said for four years now that domestic violence is a man's issue, but as uh, the coronavirus has continued now for some seven, eight, nine months, we have come to understand that the incidences of domestic violence have increased uh, between 10 to 30 percent, not only in the United States, but around the world. Depending on who you look, look to or who you talk with, the, the reasons for this increase in violence, um, they, the reasons are vary, um, but I just want to talk to you about a couple of them, and then I want to talk about a possible solution. Um, one of the major reasons that people believe that domestic violence has increased is uh, because of the increased stress that has been caused by the virus and, and the living conditions and the situations that we're facing. Also, there's been an additional um, addition of isolation that has been placed through um, the quarantines, through the all of the things that uh, have been instituted, people are together and they are isolated. And we know that domestic violence, one of the issues with the domestic violence or gender-based violence is um, the isolation of the victim. Um, economic anxiety has increased, um, obviously, and that has caused a significant um, a stressor uh, for relationships. Also the increase uh, in the use of alcohol um, alcohol will change the person's ability to make right and good choices. Um, and then finally, um, the lack of resources. And, you know, just step back and think for a second. Um, just something as simple, if you had a, a minor injury and tried to get into an emergency room, how difficult was, has that been? Um, what hoops do you have to jump through just to get into the emergency room? And once you get into the emergency room, what kind of isolations and stuff have happened? So that's actually reduced um, the, the resources that are available uh, for persons. So today I want to um, talk to you a little bit about a program called Amending, through, Amending Together Through Faith. The Amending Together program uh, is a primary prevention program that engages men and boys to challenge a culture that supports violence against women. It is created to cultivate human masculinity and change the future for women and girls. Can we go to the next slide, Carrie, please? One of the things, uh, let's get to the next slide as well, please. One of the things that uh, we do know that is one in four women and one in 10 men in the United States experience some type of violence, either sexual or physical or sexual or physical abuse or stalking. In 2000, from 2016 to 2018, the number of intimate partner violence incidences increased 42%. And one of the statistics that has not changed um, over the last five years is that three women die every day at the hands of someone who loves them. Now think about that, that, that three women today in the next 24 hour period will be dead at the hands of someone who loves them. And 42% uh, more people are being um, injured because of intimate violence, partner violence, um, 
42% more. And that we talk about now intimate violence or intimate partner violence. We use that phrase now just to help people remember um, that, that many, many, many times gender-based violence is not uh, caused by someone who is a stranger. It's someone who a person has an intimate relationship, a close relationship, someone who they have probably said at some point in time during that relationship that they love them. So we're not talking about just the stranger off the street coming and causing a problem. We're talking about people who love each other, who care for each other, and in many situations are in committed marriages and loving relationships. Let's get to the next slide. So how big is the problem? Um, we're gonna take this kind of a piece at the time. Domestic violence has some male victims. And so many times after we talk about gender-based violence or domestic violence, I always get an email or I always get a, a conversation or phone call. Well, you talk about women and girls, you never talk about men. So I, I just wanna put it out there. We talked about the statistics just a second ago. Um, there are male victims in domestic violence and we need to speak out for them. We need to understand that that's happening and we need to speak for the victim who is a man. But in almost all, 90% of the cases of violence against men and women, the perpetrator of the violence is a man. So most of what we're gonna talk about today is violence against women, but that does not excuse or accept the violence against men. But the reason we say that domestic violence or gender-based violence is a man's problem is because we know that 90% of all of the perpetrators of violence against men and women are men. Now, what is more surprising is that we don't speak enough about the impact of domestic violence on men as it deals with the women that of importance in their lives who have become victims. These include fathers, sons, brothers, friends, um, and men whose wives have been in abusive relationships prior to their marriage. I would ask you to just take a moment now and just think um, of all of the women and men that, that you have in your close connection, I would dare say that you probably know of at least one or two who have been victims of either domestic violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or stalking. Let's get to the next slide. So what do we know? One of the things that we know that is when a man takes a role of mentoring and training other men about domestic violence and attitudes that, that will change, attitudes change and violence will decrease. So men, we have a responsibility to speak about domestic violence. We have a responsibility to talk about the role that we have as men to stop domestic violence in our homes, in our communities, and in our churches. And, and just on a side, domestic violence is a problem in our churches. We tend not to um, talk about that much. We, we choose to say that that doesn't exist, but I'm here to tell you, um, I very infrequently go two or three months where I don't get a phone call, an email, or have a conversation with someone who talks about domestic violence or gender-based violence or objectification or microaggressions that occur in church, in their churches every day. The next thing that we know is that when young men are in healthy mentoring relationships that talk about healthy masculinity, violence decreases. Now, now, see, we don't talk about that as much either. Um, we have talked about for many, many years the role that we have in, in mentoring our youth and young men and young adult men. 
But what we now know is that there is a connection between our opportunities to mentor and welcome young men into our relationships and us into theirs. Once we're willing to take an interest and begin to talk about what it means to truly be a healthy man, to be a, a person who is a person of honor, a person who is um, a Christian, who is following the teachings of Christ. When we have those hard conversations many times with young men, what we ultimately do is create an environment where potential future domestic violence decreases. And then finally, what we know is that when a group of men in a church learn about domestic violence and covet with each other in accountable groups to discuss and speak out about the violence and the situations and, and all of the microaggressions and all of the object, object, objectification that is occurring in uh, their experience of church and community, then the church and the community changes. Now, you might say, um, well, I don't see any situations of, of objectification or microaggressions um, that occur. Let's get to the next slide. We see it almost every day. We see it in advertising. We see it in comments. Uh, when we say to, to young men, act like a man or ask them, why are you acting like a girl? Um, we see it in advertising. And, and this is actually an older one, but just recently I saw another one. Um, this one really struck home though. This is Mother's Day. Get back to the job that really matters. And it's by Mr. Clean. What is that saying about women? Their role is in the household cleaning. And then finally, um, time after time after time, um, I, see, I see articles, I see advertisement, I see TV commercials that objectify women and also objectify men. So, you know, my question is, um, what does that woman and the hamburger that she's holding have to do with each other? Absolutely nothing. As I mentioned before, um, we use the phrase, act like a man. What does that mean? We do not define um, what healthy masculinity is or what ha healthy masculinity can look like. Uh, and what that ends up doing is causing a lot of confusion, as hopefully this is embedded, this is an embedded, embedded video in this next slide. Hopefully this slide will be able to kind of give us an inkling of. Be a man. It took me a while to learn what that meant. a man? Hmm. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. Unafraid. Courage. Strong. Like if somebody dares them to do something and they won't do it, they say be a man. Hmm. Awesome. Insult. Older. Um, people have said be a man to me and because I was kind of being a wuss and they were basically telling me to buck up. I feel like it's kind of sexist when someone just says, be a man, well, they're strong women as well. Uh, strong. Stupid. It's almost a sexist phrase too, like if you're not being a man, it's kind of saying you're being a woman in a way too. Take responsibility. Insulting. Focused. Because to be a man, you need to be focused and strong and uh, have a good understanding of the world around you so you can be a better person. Misleading. I've learned that being a man doesn't mean to shut out your feelings, it's to embrace them. Strong. First word that popped in my head was derogatory. A lot of people feel that when you're telling someone to be something, you're inherently wrong because people can be anything they want to be. Someone who he can be a hero to someone. As long as you own up to it, then I think you kind of define that role. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it seems really um, kind of one-sided, one-dimensional. Remember your duty. Toughen up. Bullshit. 
So what does that even mean? That's such a, that's such a vague term, be a man. You know what? Classically, men have beat the shit out of women. That's what men have done. And so that's not the man I want to be. Being a man is being responsible, is being able to take care of yourself. Tough. Provide, secure. Pump some iron. To stand up for what you believe in. There's no real definition of what that is to be a man, but there's an assumption when someone says it like that, that there is a very clear definition of what men should be. Strength, conviction. Responsibility. Overrated. Well, who, who defines what a man is? I mean, we all have to walk our own paths. What I consider to make me a man may not be what makes you a man. For me, it's like hardworking. Strength. Sexist. It's a very accepted form of sexism. The be the man, it implies that you need to be something specific. Silly. Relative. Honest. Take ownership. Cliché. Choices. Honesty. Being true to yourself and your surroundings, the people you work with, the people you live with, the people you love. Trust your instincts. Be strong. Don't let people push you around. And uh, be kind to women. What it was really talking about was the concept that from age five to age 95, when people are talking about healthy masculinity, what they are saying is that it means to be strong, to be in control, to be um, domineering. Now, there were some people in that commercial that said, well, you know, it means caring. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase that's antiquated. But I think that we need to be together in having some conversations about what does it mean to be a man in this culture? And what does it mean to be a healthy man in relationships, not only with women, but in relationships with each other and in relationships with our children? Does our language do our actions speak what we hope they will say? Domestic violence um, affects children and youth in, a, in amazingly horrific ways. Uh, hospitals, hospital visits for depression, accidental harm, and feeling of um, so any type of anomalies uh, our feeling of concerns have increased. Troublemaking friends in, in households that have um, active domestic violence going on, children tend to be socially um, awkward. They have trouble making friends. Um, the instability that occurs in the household almost always causes grade problems. There are issues in the home in the home where the children um, and youth feel unsafe, um, they keep secrets um, because they're afraid. They don't have a, a skill set of speaking openly and honestly with other people because they're afraid that, that they might be harmed. And in the child, there's just a maladjustment, lower social com competence, anger, withdrawal, and a low level of empathy. What causes all of this to happen? Well, we think that, you know, we want to just totally blame it on anxiety. We want to blame it on relationships. We want to blame it on a variety of things. But what we know is that there is an environment that, um, and there is a language and there are actions that objectify women and girls, that objectify and demean people, that causes um, persons to feel less than 
or we make other people look like they're less than. When we objectify women, basically what we're saying is all they are are instruments or, 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 or items. They are not human beings. And when we stop looking at another person as a human being who is loved and cherished and cared for um, by God, and because they are important to God, they need to be important to us. Once we lose that side, then it's okay to do anything. Microaggressions occur in a variety of ways. And what it does is it, what, it, what happens is it creates a culture where women have to live in fear. Last year, about this time, I did a workshop with um, a group of youth and I had, um, one of the faculty of the college that I was working with come and speak about how she had to um, handle herself in that college environment. And she challenged the guys that were in our Amending Through Faith course to think about this. And she said, how many of you have to look over your shoulder when you're walking through the quad? How many of you feel like you need to call security at after sunset to drive to your car. How many of you have heard people whistle at you when you go by? And how many of you have heard um, others call you um, derogatory terms like bitch or whore? It's a problem that exists and it's a problem that exists uh, not only in our college campuses, but in um, our communities. And earlier we've, we've talked, I, over the time we've talked a little bit about the, the po politics, and I am not going to become political in any way in my conversation, except to say that I have heard in campaign conversations and in interviews on, in all of the political parties, uh, phrases and words that have dehumanized and objectified women and girls for the sake of making them seem less than so that the other person could be superior. That needs to stop, gentlemen. We need to create um, an environment that cultivates relationships, that cultivates um, images that helps cultivate safety um, and security for all of God's people. So next slide, if you would, please, Carrie. So what do we need to do? First of all, we need to speak up. We need to have the courage to speak up when we see situations that objectify the other. And that other could look like anything in this particular conversation, we're talking about domestic violence. So anytime that we see actions or hear words or get in the middle of jokes or, or conversations that are objectifying women and girls, we need to speak up and say that it's inappropriate. We need to speak up to cultures that, that dehumanize women or that, uh, that uh, cause situations where women are are not able to be able, are not able to participate fully um, in the workplace or in the church community. We need to speak up to the microaggressions that are causing problems. Next slide. We need to speak out. We need to speak out when we when we see situations we need to speak out for justice. We need to speak out for justice for men and for women and for others who um, cannot speak for themselves. Um, we, it's, it's difficult. And, and at the same time, we need to speak out uh, in ways that do not cause harm to the other. Women do not need us to, to speak out about injustice for them. They need us to speak out about injustice that we see that is causing problems for them. Women do not need to be um, 
objectified. That's just the bottom line. But next slide. We need to lead change. Five years ago, um, when I came to the commission, one of my first conversations was uh, with Gil Hanke, our general secretary. And in that conversation with Gil, one of the one of the first things that we spoke about um, was the fact that for too long we have asked the victim of domestic violence to change and stop being victimized. That doesn't work. That doesn't work any more than we can ask a person who is having difficulty breathing because they're having an asthma attack to breathe better. We need to begin as men of faith, as men who are committed to an equal justice for all. We need to lead change. And the way that we lead change, I believe, is by beginning conversations with faithful men, the, the good men in our church, who are willing to speak up and speak out and make change in their communities. And finally, I think I would encourage you, the next slide if you would please carry. Um, I would encourage you to be change. It takes courage when you're in the middle of a group of men who are making objectifying comments or jokes. It takes courage to say, no, stop. It takes courage to be a bystander um, watching a conversation happening in your work environment and you're kind of out from on the outside watching it. It takes courage to walk up to them and say, no, that's wrong and we don't stand for that. It takes courage to stop and be willing to report domestic violence when you see it, to not be that person who thinks that another is going to bring about change. So be the change. One of the ways that you can be the change is by offering opportunities in your church and in your community to have these hard conversations. Amending Through Faith is a program that was developed um, in partnership with the YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee. It is a primary prevention tool, we believe, that stops domestic violence by creating environments and cultures that cultivate relationships and diminish um, actions that um, cause objectification and harm to women and girls. It is an eight week study um, that will allow men to look at the issues of, of domestic violence, all of the issues that help to perpetuate environments that allow domestic violence to occur, and then begin to look at um, how they can be instruments of change. Um, we at the commission um, are willing to work with you um, and, and offer, um, offer some assistance in um, leading um, some of these conversations. Because one of the things that we know is that um, until our men have had an opportunity to go through um, an amending through faith uh, training session, many of them are not willing to be facilitators. So one of the things that we suffer with in in many areas is not having enough facilitators to have the conversation. The program is developed and has been developed and there are resources to help men be facilitators without going through the training. But so many of our men um, have felt that it was necessary for them to take the course and then they would be able to do that, uh, be facilitators. So we're willing to 
assist in doing that. And when we do that, we only ask one thing, and that is that you're willing to go out and replicate that with other people. When one man speaks out for change in the area of domestic violence, when one man speaks out against the objectification of women, when one man speaks out about um, the fact that harm needs to stop, that justice needs to occur, it becomes contagious and things change. So I would encourage you guys to do two things. Number one, be instruments of change in your community. Speak up when you hear uh, or when you have opportunity, speak up when you have opportunity, when you're in places where you hear statements that objectify women or you see situations where harm is being called. And secondly, I would encourage you to be involved in amending through faith groups, these small groups of accountable men working together to have conversations um, and look for strategies and have developed strategies to change cultures that cause harm. Next slide. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you guys today. Um, again, thank you for the support that you have for, um, that you have given us in the Center for Men's Ministries and also um, you've given Stephen in the Center for Scouting Ministries. It's because of your, uh, your work and because of your financial um, and service support, we're able to um, change lives. So questions, I, I've seen some of them that have come up on the side, but Carrie, do you want to lead that conversation or Mark? With one of so the Rick, I, I'm actually going to uh, okay, Chris. moderate that, but uh, as we do that, because we've got uh, eight or 10 questions, I'm not sure we can get to them all. I'd like to do a quick time check with Mark and Carrie, uh, so I can manage how many questions uh, we can ask. Great questions, guys. So We're doing Mark good, Chris. We're good, doing good on time. Okay, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, these in a certain order because there's a certain sequence here getting to how can we implement this here in North Georgia. But let's sort of end with that. But first question is, how can we tell when words and attitudes may turn into violence without getting into a full session today? <laughs> what we know um, is that any words that are derogatory or that create an environment um, where women are seen as less than um, or seen as um, inferior will lead to environments that violence will occur. I mean, it's just kind of that easy at this point. Got it. Okay. Um, Define objective five. Uh, is it to make an object rather than a person? Um, I'm just, I'll just read this. Slide. Define objective five sure. to make an object rather than a person, question mark. Sounds too much like objective, which is a positive word. Uh, to objectify simply means to objectify a person or to cause a, the objectification of a woman, of a person means to take a person and make them an object. So they become an object for a means to an end. So they are not a human being. They are um, a sex symbol. They are a, a person, they are one who has um, a job like cleaning. They are the person who feeds us. They are the person who, whatever, they, they become an object as opposed to a human being. Gotcha, okay. Um, what has been the results of from the Mending Through Faith study, and how has it been received by the participants? I'm sorry, one more time? What has been the results from the Mending Through Faith study, and how has it been received by the participants? Sort of a two-part question. Okay, yep. The Mending Through Faith study over the last four years has been used in uh, approximately 400 churches. Um, I'm sorry. 150 churches with about 400 to 700 participants. It has been used on three college campuses and it is a major part of a domestic violence awareness program of a university here. Um, one, of the, um, one of the men who participated in one of our early 
um, Amending Through Faith um, sessions. Uh, and I'm going to not quote him, but I'm going to paraphrase him. Uh, he became one of our leaders. He said, one of the things I didn't realize is um, how my words and how I spoke to my wife and saw my wife was causing her harm. If it had not been for the Amending Through Faith program, my wife told me that I had about three months before she was going to walk out. Mm. Um, the other thing that he said was he didn't realize how what he was speaking, when, when he was speaking, even though he wasn't raising his voice, he was actually yelling at his wife because of the language that he was using. And we've seen and heard that from a variety of different places. On the college campus that we've done the ministry, that we've done Amending Through Faith, uh, we've um, gotten reports back from um, faculty and staff and the participants uh, about an awareness of the culture on the campus that was causing um, harm to girls and women on the campus, but also how it made them more aware uh, and how it began to, to increase conversations with men and women on the campus, talking about how each other viewed the other um, and how um, healing and good had come from it. Mm. Well, those are powerful testimonials. Um, we've got a, couple, got a bunch of questions that are going to continue on, so we're going to have to manage this, this uh, part of the session because I know we've got a lot more here. But uh, how do you suggest we promote this ministry in the North Georgia Conference? Um, I think first, I think first there has to be a realization that what we say as men, what we say as people um, have power, our words have power, and they have the power to either heal or to hurt. Um, and once we realize that that is a reality, then I would encourage um, men in local congregations, uh, I would encourage churches uh, to adopt a program similar to, and I believe, actually right now we know that Amending Through Faith is the only program in the United States that is a primary prevention tool. Okay, um, I'm gonna so, combine a, a couple things here. Sorry, Rick. Um, I, I see Bob Dow, uh, he's done some pro bono legal work on domestic violence. He'd be happy to facilitate a program if he can do it remotely. Of course, these days, everything's remotely anyway. Um, so is there a training program you guys have a template for and that, that you teach or this pro the program teaches or are you looking for local facilitators to get trained to do the train the trainer so that we can teach it here in Georgia? Actually, we're looking for both. We are willing to, to teach and facilitate the Amending Through Faith program. And as I said, the, um, the way our, our hope at the commission at the Center for Men's Ministries is that as we teach uh, programs like the Amending Through Faith pro uh, program, that there will be men who are willing to become facilitators. This particular program, uh, Amending Through Faith, uh, was developed so that it could be used similar to an eight-week Bible study or book study, mm -hmm. uh, except the purpose of this is to change communities, to change attitudes, and to change lives.